You're listening to the podcast of the Andrea Mitchell Center for the Study of Democracy at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm Matt Berkman. Our guest today is a friend of the podcast, Eric Ortz, who is the Guardsmark Professor of Legal Studies and Business Ethics at the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he's been on the podcast before, and he's back uh, to talk to us today about the upcoming elections and uh, the United States Senate. Eric Ortz, uh, welcome back to the podcast. Great to be here. Nice to see you again. So most people are focused right now on the presidential election in November, but uh, control of the Senate is also on the line in this election. Um, for listeners who might be less familiar with the particular operations of Congress, can you give us a sense of what is at stake uh, when it comes to the Senate? Yeah, sure. Uh, so in the United States, we have a uh, unusual system uh, compared to many democracies. So we have the possibility, which we're experiencing now, that the legislature and the uh, president are, di uh, are, are basically different parties, controlled by different parties. So par parliamentary systems don't have that. And many people have thought, including Americans, when they're doing foreign policy abroad, that that makes uh, our presidential uh, system makes it a little bit unstable comparatively. And maybe we're a little unstable now. But the uh, Senate, we also have a bicameral legislature. So the House is one uh, body that passes legislation and the Senate is the other. So you have to have agreement in both of those bodies. The House has to pass a bill, the Senate has to pass a bill, and then the president has to sign the bill. Uh, and it's possible if the president doesn't want to sign the bill to uh, have uh, to overrule that, uh, overrule the veto by uh, supermajority votes in the Congress. So the Senate's very important for legislation. And right now we have an example of how the Senate can stop uh, legislation. So you'll have almost, uh, I believe the last count is 400 plus bills that the Democratic House has passed and the Senate has just stopped those bills. And essentially the Senate majority leader who uh, in that role has accumulated a lot of power over the years is able to stop that legislation. So one big uh, power of the Senate is legislation and being able to stop or, or, or uh, uh, adopt legislation. The second biggest role is the power of approval or confirmation of judicial appointments. So that's a power only the Senate has. Uh, the president has the power to appoint federal judges, and this includes district court trial judges, appellate court judges, and the Supreme Court. And the Senate has the power to confirm. And so their hearings and everybody, most people uh, know and have seen the uh, highly publicized confirmation hearings that you have in the Senate. They have become very controversial. And recently there was a shift in the rules of how, you, uh, how, how many votes you needed to have in the Senate for confirmation. And it's now just a bare majority vote. And so uh, if the Republicans have power, then they have a significant amount of clout over appointments. Uh, and the same thing would be true if the Democrats have uh, power over that, uh, that point. One last power that the Senate has, which has become a little less uh, important over the years, is the treaty making approval power. Uh, but many, uh, much, Amer much of uh, international law is now made by executive order, by executive agreements. So the treaty uh, power has been not as important as those other two, legislative uh, power and the uh, power to confirm judicial appointments and also appointments in the White House. Yeah, I recall back when uh, Obama was in his final, the final term of his presidency, final couple months of that term, uh, he nominated Merrick Garland to the Supreme Court um, and the Senate controlled by uh, under the leadership of Mitch McConnell uh, refused to uh, allow the confirmation of Garland to proceed. Yeah, they, they I, actually he refused even to have hearings uh, of, uh, of Merrick Garland. So Obama had appointed Merrick Garland. Many people thought uh, that this would be a relatively uh, neutral appointment because Merrick Garland, uh, with respect to his ideology, was pretty much in the middle. Uh, very highly respected uh, judge of the DC Court of Appeals. And then uh, McConnell, in an unprecedented move, this has really never happened before, just decided to refuse uh, to hold hearings or to have any vote on Garland. So rather than taking the heat of actually have hearings, then having the guy appear very reasonable, which he would have because he's really a middle of the road kind of uh, appointment. Uh, instead, McConnell just decided not even to have uh, the hearings. And this was unprecedented and it really escalated the, co the comp competition 
that where the Senate was really being used to hold up any kind of federal uh, judicial appointments. Um, and this was, uh, this was really quite frightening to a lot of people. And, and still today, we're in some crisis, I think, in the, uh, in, with respect to Supreme Court appointments, because of course, once, the, once Trump won the election and then the Republican Senate had power, they have pushed through huge numbers of federal judicial appointments. And with respect to the Supreme Court, they changed the rules, whereas used, it used to be a, a, a super majority of 60 votes was required to confirm a Supreme Court justice. Uh, McConnell and the Republican majority in the Senate changed that rule to a simple majority vote. And so both Brett Kavanaugh and Neil uh, Gorsuch were passed, were confirmed by the Senate on party line votes. So you see that this is an example of an increasing polarization that we've seen in our system where the Republicans are really not willing to bend and maybe, or, and there's not a, there's not an idea that you appoint a judge who's somewhere in the middle is basically is going to you know, call balls and strikes as chief justice Roberts uh, said uh, at his confirmation hearings, but that had become more slanted. And so the uh, judiciary as a result, the Supreme Court has become much more politicized than I think it has been in the past. Although, you know, there's a, there's a lot of room for debate. Obviously politics has always been part of lawmaking and the, and the, and the Supreme Court, et cetera. But I think it's even become much more so uh, with that kind of a change that, that McConnell and the Republicans instituted. So we're, we're at a similar point at the end of Trump's first term that, you know, we were at in Obama's second term when Obama attempted to appoint uh, Garland. And of course, as we know, uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, is constantly in the hospital. She's kind of on the edge. Um, she could, God forbid, uh, die before uh, uh, Trump's first term ends. Um, if that happened, do you think that uh, McConnell would attempt to uh, push through uh, a Republican appointee um, before Trump leaves office, even though when uh, Obama was president, he he gave the argument that it's uh, you know it's too late in the the president's term uh, to do that, and you have we have to let the people decide uh, who should be the Supreme Court justice through the upcoming presidential election. Yeah, the answer is yes, and in fact, you know that because someone asked McConnell that very question, and he said yes, we're definitely going to try to do that. <laughs> so there's no doubt that. Unfortunately, I, I think that this has changed over the years. The Republican Party has become much more partisan than it used to be and much more sort of bare knuckles in how it handles things. So there really isn't any sense of fair play. So uh, in that, you see that in the Merrick Garland case, you, you know, first you refuse to even have hearings for one, uh, for, for a presidential appointment of a justice, then you change the rules so you can kind of push through two of your appointments just on bare majority votes. And now, yes, I think that there's, uh, he's, uh, 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 Senator McConnell has even said that he'll uh, do exactly that. They'll try to rush through that an appointment. And so Trump will appoint. McConnell will try to have a, uh, well, will have and will probably approve a replacement. Now, I think depending on what happens, and this is why the uh, Senate elections are so important coming up. So the, I think a lot of the, you know, some of my colleagues do, um, uh, estimates of probabilities and, uh, and that sort of thing. And I think the current general consensus is that there's something around a 90% chance that most academics who are looking at the uh, election, the presidential election, are predict are, are saying uh, for for Biden victory. So Biden is very high, very far ahead in the polls in mo in many different states. Although Hillary Clinton was also right. It's true. I'm not saying uh, you know I'm a I happen to be a Democrat and I will be camp campaigning for Biden. Uh, I won't be going door to door perhaps, but I'll be online <laughs> sort of calling people up. But yeah, I, so uh, but you're right. Uh, you, you can't rely on that. But my point is that it's much closer with respect to the Senate. And so that matters a lot. Biden could win, but it's a much different matter whether there, uh, it's a much closer matter whether they, uh, whether he will win in the Senate. Now, if that in fact would occur where if Biden wins in the presidency and the Senate uh, and, and we have a, a, a unified government of Democrats, both the House, Senate, and then the president, then I think you're going to see some possibilities for change. You could start to see, for example, um, 
some pushback on the Supreme Court. I don't think it's out of the question to say, well, if you're going to play hardball politics and you're going to push your two people in there by hardball politics, then let's just add, let's just add two new positions to the Supreme Court. Court packing, like FDR tried to do. And I, I, yeah, I like a lot of people say that, and they, I think the court packing plan by FDR was way over the top. Uh, it compared to this, I really think of it more as court balancing. So everyone jumps to the court packing analogy, but if you really accept the fact that the other side played hardball to get to, to get a majority in their direction, and then if the if the American public elects a government that's democratic, I don't think I at least uh, my current thinking is it would make sense to rebalance the court. What is the constitutionality of that? Oh, it's entirely constitutional. So in fact, over time. Uh, there's nothing in the Constitution that says you have nine justices of the Supreme Court. So I think you've had anything anywhere from, uh, I think, seven or, or seven or so to uh, as many as 12. Or th It's in that range. So it's clear that the Congress and the president have the power to change that, the, uh, how many uh, justices are on the court. Now, obviously, uh, you can't, if you go too far and you uh, end up in a situation where it's, it's going back and forth, just depending on whoever's in power, the problem is, from a legal point of view, you lose the sense that the law is really and somehow objective, and the judges really are nonpartisan and not part of this. The problem is, though, that you what, what happens when one side politicizes it and slants the court to one direction, which we've had now, and then uh, picking up on your example, if Ginsburg were to die and, you shut, and the Republicans shoved through another uh, justice, then you'd really have a heavily imbalanced court toward uh, the Republican point of view, and if you look at what the Democratic agenda might be in terms of, you know, dealing with uh, uh, a Green New Deal or a huge, all these, all these legislative measures that have been bottled up now for three and a half years because uh, McConnell won't even have votes on things, you can see that the power of the courts to strike down a lot of the, that legislation would be a very big thing. And that's one reason why a lot of Republicans, despite what what is pretty apparently a, a Donald Trump's craziness and incompetence, really. A lot of uh, Republicans still say, well, look at the courts. We're really, you know, we, we, like, we like what's happening in the courts. We like these kinds of appointments. So, you know, we'll just keep, we'll just keep voting for Trump and figure out, and hopefully he won't be too crazy. So let's turn now to the elections in November. How many Senate seats are actually up for grabs? I mean, we know that there are some that Democrats are definitely going to win and Republicans are definitely going to win. But how many are truly competitive races and what would Democrats need to take back the Senate? Yeah, I say if you go down the list, there's a and we don't have to go into each of the different states unless you want to. But there's uh, about 10 safe Republican seats. So. Uh, that means that there's pretty much no chance, uh, very low chance that a Democrat would win. Uh, there's about seven safe Democratic seats. And then there are some that lean Re Republican, some that lean Democrat, and then there are some that are really uh, clear, uh, clear toss up. Well, let's talk about those. Well, I'll just give you a background first. So the, the current balance is 53 Republicans to 47 Democrats. So many people were saying that's going to be pretty hard because it's not really, there's only, there's only a one third of 100 uh, senators are up at any time. Uh, every every two years. So that's going to be pretty hard to win that. So, uh, but once you start to look into it, you then need three or four uh, seats to switch. And I think um, first, probably the Democrats are going to lose one, and that's in Alabama. So we just had a very contested election, which was pretty surprising. I thought that you saw Se uh, Jeff Sessions, who took on, shows the power of Trump in the Republican Party right now. I mean, Jeff Sessions had been legendary senator from Alabama for many years, and he went back. He stopped being attorney general, of course, after he got fired. And then he got beat uh, by basically by a football coach. But that football coach is very uh, is very high up uh, in the ratings against the incumbent Democrats. So let's just take off one minus one for the Democrats to that. That means the Democrats have to make that up by winning four or five uh, different seats. Um, and we can walk through, I'll, you want to hear my bottom line, or you want to walk through the different... Uh, I mean, if there are not too many genuine toss-ups, let's, let's go through them one by one. Yeah, well, let's go through, let's go through a few, a few uh, let's go through a few of them. So 
One, uh, so let's take off the map, a loss in, Del in Alabama. Now, I really like Doug Jones. I think he is, he might, and we might be underestimating the power of uh, whether there's a lot of people who are going to vote who uh, don't usually vote. So it's possible that he could still win in Alabama. He's an incumbent. It would be great if he did. And if Doug Jones was in Alabama, then I think the Democrats are going to win control. But he just kind of uh, squeaked in there last time because of the whole Roy Moore exactly. candidacy. Right. Yeah, it was just such an outrageously terrible candidate on the other side who had really bad allegations against him that even, you know, you just couldn't, he wasn't a decent person or that there wasn't a sense of a decent uh, choice. So let's just start with a, a top, top pick would be Arizona. Arizona is probably going to uh, switch. Uh, you have uh, Kelly, uh, who is an astronaut running there. Uh, astronauts seem to run to win. And he's uh, the husband of Gabby Giffords, right? Husband of Gabby Giffords. So there's this huge sentimentality, as I, and I believe it, it correctly so, that you have someone who's saying, look, we need, really need to have some common sense gun regulation in this country. And look at my, you know, this is my, my, uh, my wife was, has her career ended, essentially. So yeah, there's a lot of sentiment for him. He's, he's a pretty far up in the polls. I think he's about 10 points up. And that's been pretty consistent. So score one for the Democrats, I think, in Arizona. Uh, second race is in Colorado. Uh, Cory Gardner is unpopular there. He's been towing the line with Trump. Um, and uh, I think that uh, you have the former governor uh, who is relatively popular uh, named Hickenlooper. A presidential candidate. Was it? Well, as, as what, 30 other presidential candidates? Uh, yes, but he was a presidential candidate, but I don't think he was maybe, uh, I don't know, he maybe came about 2% or something like that. But yes, he was a presidential candidate, but then he was convinced to come back. He's running for Senate, and I think that's going to be former governor. Plus, I think you're going to have Biden doing well in Colorado. It's a purple state. It's maybe even turning bluish purple these days. So score two for the Democrats, I would say, in Colorado. Um, next up is North Carolina, which a lot of people had thought was very red. But in fact, Obama won North Carolina once and maybe twice. I think at, le at least once. Um, and it was close once. I, I, I don't know the exact record on that. But anyway, Dem North Carolina has actually been trending uh, to be p more purple than red. And right now you have a, a candidate who seems to be doing really well, Cal Cunningham, who's out, up about eight points. I, I just checked the poll today and I had him up eight points. So I would say that's another likely, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a toss up, uh, could go either way still. A lot of conservative votes also in North Carolina, but I think you could right now, right now count North Carolina in the Democratic camp. And then uh, the last one I just put up there as, a, as likely, and, uh, and by the way, I should give Aaron Blower, who is a high school student about, actually, he's almost a student of the Mich University of Michigan, who has volunteered to help me with some of this analysis. So I want to give him a shout out because he's, <laughs> he, has, uh, he has a very, he has, he's, he's really wonkish in this area in a, in a good way, uh, in the word wonky. Uh, and uh, uh, the fourth one, though, so you have Arizona, Colorado, North Carolina, and I think Maine. So Susan Collins really... Mm -hmm. um, got a lot of people upset with her vote in favor of Kavanaugh. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a huge amount of money raised to beat uh, Collins, no matter who it was, <laughs> just who anybody but Collins. Uh, they have a really pretty strong uh, candidate in, uh, in, in Gideon there. And I think she's uh, currently, I, I, the, the polls have shown her to be like four or 5% up on Collins in Maine. So if that comes out that way, that's four, that's a gain of three. So that basically gives the uh, Democrats control if uh, Biden. Uh, well, I, you know, Biden I see wins. where you're going with this. And it was one of my questions. So let me just let me just f formulate it. Uh, you know, the vice president uh, under the Constitution is also the president of the Senate. Um, and so what power does the VP actually wield in this position? Yeah, I, I, I think traditionally it has not been thought that the vice president has a lot of uh, particular extra powers. Now, if you did have a 50-50 split in the Senate, the vice president does have the, t have the, uh, have the tie vote. So the, the power in the Senate would come in if you had 50-50 votes that were very close and this vice president constantly had to come in and break the tie. 
that would make a difference. So you do want someone who can be, who kind of has a general understanding of that, connecting with Biden and basically voting the way the president wants. So I don't think there's really a particularly uh, big role that the uh, president pro-, pro tem plays, who is the vice president. Okay, so case. assuming they lose Alabama, the Democrats have to win these these three, uh, I'm sorry, these four uh, other races and uh, also win the presidency in order to totally control the Senate. And then there's a lot of other interesting races, which I think are winnable by Democrats. So just to go through those real quickly, and then we can open it up and talk about whatever you would like. Iowa is close. So Joni Ernst is a, is the Republican in Iowa, and she's being challenged very strongly by Teresa Greenfield, and I think the polls are currently even. So the Democrats could pick up a win there. That would increase the majority. Or they could lose one of the other elections that I just indicated. Maybe they lose Maine or North Carolina, but then they win Iowa, then they're still, then they're still 50-50. Um, Montana. Now, recently, this, uh, recently Bullock, uh, Steve Bullock also is another ex Also a presidential ex-governor. candidate. Also a presidential candidate. Also had excellent appearances on Stephen Colbert. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't know if you saw that. Anyway, I I think right now, though, he better go back on Stephen Colbert if that would help him in the polls because he's slipping a little bit in the polls. But um, I think that he's I don't think you can count him out. Right. He's won elections in Montana as governor before. And then in particular, if you I think they're. COVID, COVID-19, uh, the COVID-19 cases are increasing in Montana. Maybe people are going to start to realize that, that this problem has been completely mishandled by, the, uh, by, by Trump and switch. And then, so, you, so Bullock could really win in Montana. In Kansas, uh, uh, you have an interesting candidate, Barbara Bollier, who was a, a Republican legislature. And then because she was upset about various positions the Republicans were taking, I think particularly on healthcare, switched. So she was a very popular and, uh, and, uh, and uh, successful legislator in Kansas, switched parties, and now she's a Democrat. Um, and uh, the Republicans have made it a little bit more difficult to beat her though, because uh, Chris Kobach lost. And so uh, the challenger is named. And Kobach was Mitchell. a kind of more radical Trump-aligned right-wing figure. Yeah, and I and he was, he also just had some baggage. He was so extreme. I think he would have been easier to beat. So probably the Democrats were rooting for him to win on the chance that he on the likelihood that he would he would make the race easier for them because he's so extreme. So it's going to be harder for her to win. But I think she, you know, I think she has a really good chance in Kansas. I think she's uh, currently behind in the polls. Then the one race I really like, and I'd love to see it. I just have a, I, here's where my emotional uh, uh, feelings get involved is, uh, is Jamie, uh, I'm sorry, is uh, Jamie Harrison in South mm-hmm. Carolina, uh, who is running against Lindsey Graham. And to the surprise of many people, he is almost, he's now even in the Mm. So this is a um, this is a, a, a black candidate against uh, Lindsey Graham. He has some extremely effective ads against Lindsey Graham, showing Lindsey Graham at first saying all these negative things about Trump, and then going exactly in the reverse direction and saying all these uh, saying that he's not any of these negative things. So so he set himself up for just some really good advertising in South Carolina. And so that's another one. I think that um, Harrison's really running an effective campaign. He's running, he's, he's raising a lot of money. And so I think for people, I mean, one of the reasons I think it's nice to go through all this is that a lot of people will give their money because they really don't like some candidate, but, uh, but maybe that's not the best policy. So an example that we haven't talked about yet is Mitch McConnell. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people, including me, don't particularly like Mitch McConnell. And you can look at the, his opposing candidate, Amy, Amy McGrath, uh, who is a female candidate, for, veteran, uh, former fighter pilot, I believe, um, and very, but it had a, had a very close primary. A progressive almost knocked her off in the primary. And so then against McConnell, Okay, maybe, but she's probably way behind not. In the race. Yeah, she's pretty far behind. I think she still could win in a Biden landslide. And mm-hmm. people, I think a lot of people in Kentucky don't like the majority leader. But when you're a majority leader, you can bring home a lot of bacon, even if, you know, it's a, it, we're not supposed to have earmarks and all that anymore. But people realize, like, you know, he has a lot of power and can make people's lives better, et cetera. He's, he's been there a long time. There's a lot of, like, you know, 
chits to call in. So I think in that case, it's not likely. So then what I suggest to people is like pick another race. So if you really want to, uh, if you really want uh, someone to knock off, what's your issue? If you really want, if you really care about um, abortion rights and you care about how Susan Collins voted and she said she was going to take a certain position and then voted the other way, give your money to Gideon in, in Maine. Or if you want to see uh, another, uh, uh, the first black uh, representative from South Carolina since Reconstruction, uh, vote, you know, give your money to Harrison. And I gave him money and right he now. texts me nonstop now. It's, uh, I, I gave him money too and day. I have the same problem with him, but still. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's unfortunately the name of the game right now is, uh, is the okay, money so those That's the election side of this. Um, but, you know, the, the Senate itself is often critiqued as a kind of problematic uh, and anti-democratic institution uh, in designing the Senate. Uh, James Madison himself said that its purpose was to protect the interests of the opulent minority against the will of, of the majority, that is to protect the interests of property uh, against the people. Um, so, you know, do you think that the Senate itself should uh, be abolished? Yeah, well, I've, I've written an article called Senate Democracy in which I, uh, I, refer to what I, what I refer to a Lockean paradox. And what that is, is it's very difficult to change the Senate and yet we have to change the Senate. So then the question is, how do you do it? And the reason it's hard to change the Senate is the constitution says specifically that you may not do it. Like the constitution says you may not amend the clause that sets up the Senate. Really? So, yeah. So there's, it's an actual prohibition. The only other one was that you can't do anything about slavery until 1820 or whatever the date was. And that disappeared finally, but that, but the set, but it's right in the constitution that you can't abolish the Senate. Now that doesn't mean you can't say, well, okay, like someone could and just by sheer power, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I, I'm not in favor of an, a direct ab abolition of the Senate. What I am in favor of is what I've called a Senate reform act that recognize under the uh, post-Civil War voting rights amendments that give the power of Congress to protect voting rights. I think one of the ways that they can protect voting rights is by reconstituting how the representation structure works in the Senate. And so what I've recommended in a long article in the American University Law Review, and you can read the short version in the Atlantic, <laughs> search my name, fixing the Senate in the Atlantic, um, I give a short version of this, but basically what I say, what I suggest is that you really do have to reallocate people, uh, representation in the Senate according to population to some extent. Every state should have one, at least one senator, just like in the House of Representatives. But after that, we should divide it up a little bit. It's just completely crazy that the state of California or New York or Texas or Florida gets two senators and then Wyoming and West Virginia and uh, uh, Vermont. Yeah, well, you know, that's what senators. defenders of the Senate say is its very purpose, which is to, you know, represent uh, all parts of the country uh, equally, where, you know, at the same time, that's also what uh, makes it anti-democratic. Yeah, and that's just false. I think, unfortunately, I come up uh, about the, uh, I'm, I'm advocating for this idea, obviously, and it's a relatively new idea. I don't think other people have, uh, made the argument, but I think that uh, the idea that the the founders thought that we'd have 50 states with 300 more than 300 million people, and it was all divided up, and that the biggest state in the union would be in the West Coast, this giant state called California, is just completely crazy. So I think the idea there's this there's uh, there's um, some sort of constitutional fundamentalism that people get in their heads where. They treat the Constitution almost as if this, it's, the, it's some kind of sacred text uh, that is never changeable and that there was immense wisdom in all the people who were founding it. And in fact, if you go down at the time of the founding, there's a lot of debate about how this was work. And uh, I think, in fact, uh, Madison was in favor of a representational structure of the Senate, and it was a really close vote. And the reason why you preserve power of the states at that time was, in fact, slavery. It was the slave states that did not want pa uh, populations to change. And there was a big debate, and it was kind of notorious, of course, that uh, the South was, were allowed to have a uh, population of their own slaves counted at three-fifths of a person for representational purpose, even though none of those people, of course, could vote or even have any rights. So the idea that you go back to that period 
where you really had a fundamentally racist society, a legally structured apartheid society, and you say, well, we can't change anything ever after that, I think is, is really a wrong interpretation of, of uh, the Constitution. And so the reason, uh, so I think that the Senate and the, I think you can have a Senate Reform Act that says that, that is guaranteeing the rights of individuals to be relatively equal and that they can reform the Senate so that you would change the representational structure. So Vermont will get one senator under this uh, idea and Pennsylvania, for example, would get four. But that's fair. If you look at Pennsylvania and Vermont, how come Vermont has two senators and we have two senators? It's mm -hmm. completely, uh, it doesn't make any sense. And I'll add one other thing, especially in this time, uh, in this time when we have uh, anti-racism as a very, very high on the agenda as it should be. The Senate is also radically white. Mm. It is not just rep unrepresentative with respect to numbers, but if you start to look at it, and in particular, it's most unrepresentative for uh, Latino and Latinx uh, populations, uh, Hispanic populations, but it is also uh, very heavily unrepresentative of uh, Black Americans. And so if you really care about that, which I think we should, that's another reason why the Senate actually violates the constitutional provisions of equal rights mm. for voting. So there's a conflict in the text of the Constitution that I think you should resolve by cutting the Gordian knot and reforming the Senate to change the structure. Now, will that be difficult politically? Yes. But it's also true that uh, the Senate is one of the pr principal problems that we have right now for progress because um, it overrepresents white populations. And so it's fundamentally conservative when it comes to, uh, to anti-racist proposals, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, short of uh, entirely abolishing the Senate, well, we often hear proposals uh, for getting rid of the filibuster, which is... Uh, you know, one particular tactic that is used in the Senate, uh, which, you know, is used to block progress in certain ways. Uh, what are, what do you think about that? Uh, what are the arguments for and against getting rid of the filibuster and how would it actually uh, happen? Well, the filibuster is kind of a strange thing. Uh, it, it, it began, and, and again, it's really important to have a historical understanding of how the Senate has grown over time, right? When there were only 13 states and you had 26 people, uh, it's, it's a pretty informal group uh, compared to the 100 people, which, which we have today. So in those days, what happened is that there was a general sense that we won't have, uh, that the Senate would not use what's called a motion for the previous question, which is what the House and almost every other legislature in the world uses. What that means is, you have a debate, you set some time for debate, but then someone says, I move the previous question, which is a motion to cut off debate and move to a vote on the substantive issue. The Senate, um, for peculiar reasons, never had that, but in part because it saw itself as this collegial body, et cetera. So then what happened eventually is that people would, and this was particularly the case among uh, Southern senators that uh, were in favor of slavery, and they would use this against, for example, anti-lynching laws. And they would stand up and start talking and they would not stop talking. So, and there was not the possibility of move, moving the previous question. So they would just delay and continue. And then there was this idea on both sides that this was some great thing where uh, senators that really believed in something would stay up all night and hold up all the, hold up the process. But in fact, my, my feeling is that it's basically not that helpful. You know, obviously if you're on the side of trying to stop something if uh, Republicans are in power and you want to try to keep them from gutting an environmental law, then you kind of like, like the senator who stands up and stops that from happening because they use the filibuster. But I think we really do need to get rid of it. And, and, and in particular, we need to get rid of it uh, in terms of one, my primary concerns, which is the climate crisis. We have to have major legislative programs that are going through the next Congress. And in order to do that, you have the Democrats have to win the presidency and the Senate and hold the House. And unfortunately, I think if you have the filibuster, which under the current rules requires 60 votes to cut off, it's called a clotcher motion. You need 60 votes to cut that off and move forward with a vote. I think you're not going to get those uh, programs done. Even in the, you know, the best analysis of these uh, races that we just had, it doesn't look like the Democrats are going to get 60 senators. Uh, so um, the only way to pass a lot of this legislation, in my view, is to eliminate the filibuster. 
And the way that you do that is the senators, when they start the next session, just decide to eliminate the filibuster. Uh, the Senate gets to have power over its own rules. Um, now, Vice President Biden has not said he's in favor of it. He's been long against the filibuster, but hopefully he can be convinced uh, that to pass the laws that he really needs to pass to make progress, uh, especially after wasting all, uh, three and a half years with almost no serious good legislation. And that's with a, a simple majority. You would only need a, a simple majority of uh, the Senate to eliminate the filibuster. Well, you eliminate the filibuster right at the beginning. It should be that the uh, it should be possible that you can bring up that vote right at the beginning when you're setting the rules of the Senate and you just and you eliminate uh, the vote. So the same thing happened with respect to uh, the justices, right? So um, there was a little bit of a, there, there was, now the Democrats are not uh, uh, immune from this criticism too because it was Harry Reid as majority leader who uh, eliminated the, the, the possibility, the, the eliminated the supermajority requirement for the approval of lower court judges under Obama because the Republicans were then holding up all of the Obama appointees for the uh, judiciary. Uh, and so uh, Harry Reid said, okay, we're just going to have a simple majority vote and got started to pass uh, Obama judges through the system. Uh, and then McConnell said, okay, if you did that, then I'm going to do the same thing with the Supreme Court. So they're just doing that on simple majority vote. You also have an avenue already around the filibuster rules according to budgetary resolutions that are passed in Congress. So yes, it, it's within the power of the Senate itself to eliminate the filibuster, and I think it should do so. And if you eliminated the filibuster in one session, could it just be brought back in the next session? Uh, I, I think every Senate has the possibility of changing its own rules. There's some debate about that. I think it's... Uh, uh, some people think that the rules of the Senate somehow have to have precedential value so that if one Senate binds the uh, binds the votes of a, of a Senate be coming after that. But I don't personally think there's any constitutional basis for that. And it doesn't make any sense, right? If you, if you have a new democratically organized uh, Senate or House, when they come in, they should have the ability to set their own rules as long as they don't violate the Constitution. They can't take powers that they don't have under the Constitution. But how they, how they operate themselves, they should set up their own rules. I think there's a lot of other things they should look at too. Like I think we're bro the system's broken with respect to seniority. And you just have to watch some Senate hearings to kind of figure that out. There are like people who get a lot of power because they're there a long time and they're almost not even functional or they don't know what, a, what an iPhone is, you know, when they're asking questions. Like, so the, I think there's a real problem in seniority. Uh, and then uh, the majority leader, the power of the majority leader also has accrued and, and become greater over time. And that has to be significantly reduced. There has to be more democracy within the Senate and with, uh, in how it operates so that uh, you don't have seniority. The fact, the fact that somebody is in some safe seat forever gives them a lot more power than somebody else who is in a more competitive state. And these provisions for seniority are internal to the, to the rules of the Senate. Is that correct? Yeah, and there's nothing in the Constitution saying you have seniority. What happened is people got tired of fighting over it, but that's not a reason to, that's, not, that's no reason to keep it. For example, there's a lot of evidence those seniority rules and that kind of these kind of filibusters were the were the way in which Southern senators stopped progress on civil rights uh, and 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 the way Southern senators stopped progress on slavery kinds anti-slavery kinds of laws. So that is, uh, I think, that historical context is another reason why we should get rid of these old-fashioned procedures. But also one way that citizens themselves could push for change in this domain would be to to push for a constitutional amendment that would uh, set term limits for Congress. Is that correct? Term yeah. limits are a little different. Term limits, I think you might need a, I think you probably do need a constitutional amendment for that. I'm in favor of term limits. I think if you have term limits for the president of two, of two terms, I don't see why you should not have term limits for senators for two terms. So t that's 12 years. That's like enough. <laughs> and so similarly, maybe get, make it 10 years or whatever for the House. And you have, there are exceptions and someone might raise, what about John Lewis? Okay, well, you know, he, he obviously was a, was a great hero and, and it's, it's hard to argue that he should not have been there for all those years. But he probably, you know, I'm not sure it would be that much different. And I think the problem of uh, people staying in Congress forever 
uh, is really a problem because the power of the incumbency is so great. And then I, th I frankly think that they start to get, uh, you, you, the, the need to raise money is so great that you can't help but become a little bit corrupted by that. Mm -hmm. you know, by corrupted by the possibility of how are you going to get the next election and you're you're not you don't want to you don't want to uh uh make someone angry who's not who's not going to give you like the money the next time around right so i think that there is a, a, a reason to have term limits well we will see what happens in november with the senate and i just want to thank you again for being a friend of the podcast eric orts oh yeah <laughs> well thank you very much matt it's nice to be back and I've enjoyed this very much. Thanks.